Okay, I'd like to call to order the October Coast and City School Board meeting. And first up is pledge and inspirational reading, uh, Ms. Sheeler. Yes, I have the very great pleasure of introducing Cassidy Spakes. Cassidy Spakes is a junior at Pocosin High School and will be serving as the school board representative for this year. She is an active member of the Pocosin High School Student Council, to which she has held the position of historian and is currently the vice president. She is a member of the Key Club, the president of the French Club, captain of the cross country and track cross-country and track team, and a member of the Pocosin High School show choir evolution. Cassidy's been inducted into the Math Honor Society, the Mu Alpha Theta, French Honor Society, the International Thespian Society, the Music Honor Society, Tri-M, and the National Society of High School Scholars. It's a wonder she has time for school, right? As the school board representative, Cassidy will be serving on the Pocosin High School Bullying Prevention Committee and the Pocosin High School Principals Advisory Committee. This evening, Cassidy will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and also share an inspirational reading. Thank you, Ms. Sheeler. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> I have prepared a poem for tonight entitled Six Feet Apart. Everything is different and nothing is the same, but there would be no butterflies if we did not have change. COVID-19 has flipped the world upside down. We have gone from sunny smiles to stormy frowns. Online school and virtual learning happens every day as the world keeps turning. You may feel angry and even get mad, or maybe you cannot help but feel sad. While it is important to express how you feel, always be kind in every ordeal. Your peers and your teachers are new to this too, so being patient and understanding is something you should do. While we are away from our friends and family, they are only a phone call away if you should get lonely. So keep working hard and doing your best because you are amazing and nothing less. While we remain six feet apart, we are all together if only by the unity in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cassidy, and welcome aboard. <laughs> uh, do we have any additions or modifications to the agenda? Yes, sir, we do. We have an addition um, to, um, for consideration, for consideration this evening, um, that will be later in the evening. Okay, so, uh, additional item, um, DII, tech D, and we'll put that as item D for other matters for consideration. And next up is recognitions, uh, recognition of 2019. Here, and I believe we have a video presentation for that. Congratulations, Ms. Yeager. 
The 2020 Teacher of the Year from Coastal Elementary School is Ms. Deborah Farringer. Ms. Farringer currently teaches fourth grade and is in her 29th year in education, with this being her third year in Pocosin. She earned her undergraduate degree from Mary Washington College and holds master's degrees in elementary education and in administration and supervision from Old Dominion University. Ms. Farringer serves on the PCPS K-12 Literacy Committee and the Basketball Test and Task Bank Committee. She provides valuable instructional support to her PES colleagues through delivery of professional development and through the creation of language arts pacing guides, lessons, activities, and assessments. Ms. Farringer believes that teachers must first and foremost have a love for the job and for their students, and she is committed to helping her students grow and thrive. Congratulations, Ms. Farringer. The Coastal Middle School's 2020 Teacher of the Year is Ms. Deborah Smith. This is Ms. Smith's 25th year of teaching. 22 of those years have been here in Pocosin, where she currently teaches general and honors life science seven. Ms. Smith earned her undergraduate degree from California State University and her master's degree in special education from the College of William & Mary. She has served as the science department chair and as a member of the Pocosin Middle School instructional leadership team. She has also sponsored the Scare Club and coached the seventh grade battle of the classes team. Ms. Smith believes that today's teaching can't look like yesterday's teaching and that learning should be enjoyable and dynamic for the students and the teacher. Congratulations, Ms. Smith. The 2020 Pocosin High School Teacher of the Year and the PCPS Division Teacher of the Year is Ms. Blair Duvall. Ms. Duvall is in her 13th year of teaching and her fifth year at Pocosin High School, where she teaches family and consumer sciences. Ms. Duvall earned her bachelor's degree in marketing from Lynchburg College and earned her teaching certificate from Old Dominion University. She has served as a representative on the Teacher Advisory Council, as a project-based learning liaison, and as a CTE instructional leader. Ms. Duvall is passionate about providing her students with life skills that will be applicable upon their graduation from high school, and she prepares them to be contributing members of the community and citizens that give back. Congratulations to Ms. Duvall on being named the 2020 PCPS Division Teacher of the Year. And congratulations to all four teachers on this amazing accomplishment. The Joseph City Public Schools would like to Thank you very much and congratulations to all of our Teachers of the Year. Outstanding job. Uh, next is presentations and reports. And first up is opening with Mr. Tillich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the school board and because uh, of families, it's great to have a big crowd out here tonight. This may be our event. We probably couldn't have anybody else uh, in the room. And, uh, still comply with the regulations. We have a short presentation about uh, our phase two of transitioning students back to school. Um, What's that? There you go. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it was a big success. We we finished day six of uh, our fourth and fifth graders at uh, Pocosin Elementary School. And uh, we have, thanks to Emily Forrest, a brief presentation of this transition with some numbers of our students and uh, uh, the smiling faces you'll see as our students transitioned um, last Monday and uh, Tuesday back to school. Structured activities 
like red light, green light, or siren does. Even though there are many changes, our fourth and fifth grade students are adjusting well. It's great going back to school because I get to see my teacher in real life, and I like to see my friends and my other friends. With our fourth and fifth grade students in the continuum of learning back in school on a hybrid schedule, we currently have 239 A day students split between the primary school and the elementary school, 250 B day students split between the two schools, 15 students who attend half day pre kindergarten, Monday through Thursday, half in the morning, half in the afternoon, and 15 students with disabilities split between two adaptive classrooms that attend school Monday through Thursday. process. It's not been um, a process that uh, any of us trained for. Uh, we're educators and um, we've, uh, we can teach kids in school, but the challenge is trying to uh, educate students uh, in this crazy world we're in now and do it very, very well. That's our goal. So tonight we're going to be talking about the next steps. Uh, as you'll recall, back in July, we started this process. We presented to the board on July the 30th or the 31st, I believe, the first phases of trying to bring students back to school uh, safely. Um, we, as you know, were the uh, only school on the only school division on the peninsula to actually have students in school uh, on September the 8th, the first day of school, and that has gone extraordinarily well. Um, and, the, and you've heard me say this over and over again, and I'm going to keep saying it because it can't be said enough. And it's thanks to all the incredible educators that we have um, in this community. Our principals, our uh, district leads, our teachers, our paras, our bus drivers, uh, the ladies that work, and gentlemen that work in our cafeterias, um, our custodians who are doing extraordinary cleaning. This has been a whole team effort to make this happen, and it's happened well and safely um, thus far. Now, tonight, we're going to, and of course, you just saw we uh, were able to do the next step of this process last week when we invited our um, fourth and fifth graders who are on the continuum of learning to school, and um, <laughs> got an honored guest. <laughs> and, um, now we're going to talk tonight about the steps we will be taking or are taking as we speak and we'll be taking in the next uh, weeks to transition more students back to school and in-person learning. We're going to do this as we've said all along with the uh, primary goal of bringing our kids back safely and protecting our staff. This is a clip right from the CDC website, and I think it says it uh, better than I can say it, so I'm going to read it to you tonight. Um, uh, as families and policymakers make decisions about their children returning to school, it's important to consider the full spectrum of benefits and risk of both in-person and virtual learning options. Parents are understandably concerned about the safety of their children at school in the wake of COVID-19. The best available evidence indicates if children become infected, they are far less likely to suffer severe symptoms. At the same time, the harms attributed to closed schools on the social, emotional, and behavioral health, economic well-being, and academic achievement of children in both the short and long term are well known and significant. 
Further, the lack of in-person educational options disproportionately harms low-income and minority students and those living with disabilities. These students are far less likely to have access to private instruction and care and far more likely to rely on the key school-supported resources like food programs, special education services, counseling, after-school programs, and many others to meet their developmental needs. So our goal has been very simple all along, is to bring all of our students safely back to school as soon and as often as possible. Now we get a lot of feedback, as we should. We solicit feedback. We, we beg people to participate in the process. Um, I respond to Let's Talk um, communications every day, as does other members of our staff. And we're getting a healthy uh, diet of very good feedback and information and legitimate, thoughtful questions. Um, a lot of folks respond, when are we going to bring the middle and high school kids in? And I say the same thing over and over again, and I'll, we'll keep saying it. We're going to do it as soon as we can safely do it. I promise. So tonight, we're going to talk a lot about um, all the three areas that we have mentioned from July till now, every time we're together, and in all of our communications with our staff, with our constituents in the community, of uh, the three obstacles that we face in more traditional school. Obstacle number one is health concerns, health mitigation to this virus. Secondly, scheduling concerns. Scheduling around the requirements of safety is a challenge. Not insurmountable, but a challenge. And thirdly, staffing concerns. There is no education uh, in any community without teachers. And all the staff that it takes to make this thing happen effectively. So we're going to talk about that and um, we always want to be reminded that our people are our most important asset. So we're going to protect uh, and keep in the forefront the safety and well-being of our students and staff. These are numbers. You've seen this chart uh, multiple times now. We publish it every time we come uh, together. You just These are just sheer numbers. I won't read them to you. You can glance at them. They are also um, always available on the BDH website uh, where we pull this information daily. In addition to the um, front-facing page on BDH, and I encourage folks to look at that as you uh, have, are curious about the, the spread of COVID around the peninsula. Um, I, there is a rear-facing page that only the health departments and their staff can can access. So in addition to this public information, we, the Peninsula Superintendents, meet with the local uh, Peninsula Health Division uh, team every Thursday at 3 o'clock in a Zoom meeting and where we're able to ask very deep and uh, thoughtful questions about our planning process. So we have access to these uh, 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 medical experts as they monitor the, the, the disease on their side and then share with us this information that helps us uh, make much more informed decisions as we chip away at trying to plan bringing more students back to school safely. I will note that um, we, were, uh, we had stayed with about 76 cases of COVID in the city of Pocosin for some time. And then over the last three or four weeks, uh, we've seen a jump of about 13 uh, cases ended up at about eight, right at 89 cases. Again, not something to be overly alarmed about, but something to monitor and watch closely. Um, this is uh, cases per 100,000, and you know we report on this, so it levels the playing field in a small city like Pocosin in comparison to Hampton or uh, much larger um, areas. These are the points that the Peninsula Health Division, um, under the guidance of the Virginia Health Department, uh, has encouraged us to consider. One being that you don't want to just look exclusively at your locality because a lot of our uh, students and families 
live and work and transition in and out of the city of Pocosin to surrounding areas. So when we look at data, we're not just looking at the 12,000 residents of Pocosin. We also look at the folks who live in the, the numbers from Hampton and uh, Newport News and uh, James City, Williamsburg, and, and certainly York as our surrounding areas. And we have about 51% of our population, of our own staff, that actually live in those areas around us. Um, we look at two primary points of data. One is called case burden. The other is called um, positivity rates. And those numbers we've been advised, um, and again, we're not medical experts, but we've been advised to watch those numbers daily and over a 14-day trend. So I won't uh, bore you with all of these numbers tonight, but um, I do want you to um, understand that these are the numbers we watch daily and on a 14-day trend. Um, on the peninsula, which it, these numbers also include Hampton, even though Hampton is not considered in the Peninsula Health Division, they have their own health division, but uh, we include Hampton numbers when we talk about these peninsula data. And we're at what's called a moderate risk of transmission right now at 8%. And you'll see that number has, um, on a uh, few later slides, you'll see that number has gone up and down, fluctuated over the last 60 to 90 days. Um, and our mean um, case positivity rate is a, is, is a really good number right now at 2.8%. We're very happy with that. Um, and that's been decreasing for 14 days. If you'll notice, I included um, the last time we reported data from the 14th, we were at 5.6, and then prior to that we were 6.6 uh, and 7%. And so that number is going down, and that's good news. We do, have, we do know the uh, Peninsula Health Division um, uh, reported that there are, we know of two positive cases in private schools on the peninsula, so we're watching that closely because you, know, you, you always are concerned about the possibility of spread. Um, pardon the fuzziness of this slide, but um, I lifted this from the VDH uh, website, actually from the, the data that they provide to us from the rear-facing information on Thursdays, and you'll notice that this is a daily rate of positivity, I mean case burden at 8.2% and 2.2%, um, and that was on Wednesday of last week. We won't get this data again until uh, Thursday of this week. You'll notice the trend there, I won't read that to you as well, but you'll see the case positivity rate landing for Pocosin um, at 2.2 and uh, has been decreasing for eight days. This is brand new. Um, you all may have seen some of this in the news. The VDH has started publishing a new pool of data that comes from the Center for Disease Control. And this data is populated over a 14-day window, so it's an average of 14 days. So you'll see different numbers in these next couple of slides, but they all speak to the same trends. Um, you'll notice that um, this is the chart, and you, they've categorized it into five sections, lowest, lower, moderate, higher, and highest risk, and they're color-coded. This is as of uh, the 14th, again, when the, when the data was pulled last Thursday, um, where we land in Pocosin. This is just Pocosin data, and again, this is from the VDH uh, website that is populated based on CDC guidelines of data. 14-day average. So you'll notice that number where we look at a daily average for case burden, which is at 8, was it 8.2%. Um, that's 65.63%. That's a 14-day average uh, based on um, a thousand population. I mean, a hundred thousand population. You'll notice our, our uh, positivity rate is still fairly low. We look at 5% is that benchmark where it moves from low to moderate uh, case positivity, and we're we have remained below 5% for some time now, which again is very good news for us. So I could talk for a while about that, and I'm far from an expert. It's, it, there's just a lot of information that uh, we feel compelled to um, 
study and talk about and analyze as we prepare to move forward because again, safety is our number one priority for our students, staff, and their families. So now we're gonna talk about bringing our secondary students back to school. Um, these are the, the, the laundry list of things that our staff, and we have the smallest staff on the peninsula and one of the smallest staff uh, anywhere around. So there's a, we say this often, I've said it since I landed here July the 1st, there's, n there's not a harder working group of people in the world in this business than in the city of Pocosin. These educators around this community I'd put up against anybody, anywhere, with the amount of high quality work they get done um, uh, by wearing many hats. Um, and I'm certain that many of them don't sleep. But again, this is the list, and I'm gonna go through this, these next few slides quickly. Um, because I don't want anybody to throw anything at me. This could be lengthy and we could take all night and I promise we will go through quickly. The first thing is that we want to talk about is the process. Um, the, uh, principals and, and your school board office employees um, are, are meeting daily to work through these, uh, th this process. This requires a lot of collaborative work. The division staff will continue to monitor, help, monitor the help uh, data that I just shared pieces of with you. Um, the, the Secondary Transition Committee, which is a new group that will meet for the first time tomorrow, made up of uh, teachers, counselors, administrators. We've got um, uh, special education professionals. Our athletic director for um, Pocosin High School will serve on the committee. Uh, uh, ITRTs, school board office staff, and um, the president of the Pocosin Education Association. We also have a standing committee that's been around since July, um, the Virtual Learning Committee, that whose work is to improve continually the, our virtual delivery. This has not been easy work. Uh, teachers have to learn new tricks, use new tools. Um, I know everybody wants to talk about Canvas. Um, Canvas has been um, a challenge because it's a new tool we're learning. I promise, well I believe, months from now we'll look back and say, Canvas has been uh, a good tool for us once we learn how to use it effectively. But the virtual committee's primary role is to improve our virtual delivery because about 35% of our families chose a full virtual um, delivery uh, model for at least first semester and we've um, promised to allow that um, to uh, be ongoing and improving throughout the year. So families who want to remain on um, Pocosin Online will be able to do so uh, throughout the year. We, this is the key bullet right here. The timeline has not yet been established. And if you'll remember when we met last month, we presented these same task that, or similar tasks that we had to work through to bring, to transition our fourth and fifth graders in. We did not share a timeline at that point because we didn't know how long it was gonna take us to do all of these things. Fortunately, we were able to do it fairly quickly and um, we do uh, plan to do that same level of, of uh, that have that same level of commitment to do this as quickly and as effectively as possible. Um, currently, we have approximately 15 secondary staff members because the, who um, qualify for special leave. So if you pull 15 members of our secondary staff out of the formula, we have a staffing concern. So we have to work through the ability to teach courses without certain staff members available to be in-person instruction. Uh, we anticipate some additional staff members that may apply for this leave. And again, this is federally granted leave um, that uh, if a staff member qualifies, um, the, they, uh, that, that leave is available to them. Um, at the secondary level, we also have um, staff that um, uh, will be working with the online academy for the remainder of the semester and perhaps the year. So we're going to have to staff both deliveries. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, the challenge is, and this is, this is where it gets really in the weeds, Dividing or planning for 
pre-K through five is a very different process than planning for secondary school. I like to refer to it as subject specific courses versus grade level specific courses. If you're planning um, to divide, for example, the fifth grade, you can do it alphabetically, which is the way we chose to do it. But if you're dividing six, seven, eight through 12, you have to divide by each class. So first period chemistry class has to be divided into an A group and a B group. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, tonight. As well, uh, several of our middle school teachers uh, teach on the eighth grade bell schedule as well as the seventh grade bell schedule. So they share grade level uh, responsibilities. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, um, if a teacher is sick or needs to be out or predictably has to quarantine for possible exposure to COVID, um, we have very limited substitutes. So those are just challenges that we have to um, be aware of and plan for as we transition more students to school. Um, instruction. So how do you teach students who are sitting in front of you and at the same time students who are at home on their computers because the same teacher on the secondary level will have to do both. So these are things that we have to think through and plan because we have the same number of teachers but can only have half of the students in a particular, cl particular classroom at the time and about 35% of our uh, families on the secondary level have chosen to be virtually instructed for the remainder of the semester of the year. Um, this is a, a novel form of instruction. Um, there's not a playbook for it. It's not um, being done um, with fidelity really anywhere. We are learning as we speak. I was speaking with one of our board members just earlier who has run into a couple of folks um, in his travels that um, are doing virtual on the second uh, hybrid on the secondary level and has kind of picked some brains about that we've been in contact with other school divisions who have who are in the planning stages of delivering hybrid instruction to secondary students so we're collectively as an educational community around the state and the country learning how to do virtual delivery and in-person delivery at the same time. This is novel work. Uh, we must ensure that all the equity of instruction for students um, is the same for students at home and students in school. We want the quality to be um, the same for all of our students, regardless of the delivery system. Um, and some of our teachers will have to continue to teach from home. The, some of the teachers back to the staffing slide that have certain leave that um, prohibit them from being in front of students during this time. We're working with PE band chorus teachers to determine what in-person instruction looks like in those uh, hands-on, very um, uh, participatory kinds of classes. Uh, we want to make sure that's high quality and we continue to offer the arts. Scheduling. I mentioned it briefly when I got ahead of myself, but we are uh, looking at um, the details of ways to uh, accommodate the hybrid uh, model for our delivery. And um, our goal is to not have schedule changes, especially in the high school. These courses are for credit. So we don't want to have a student who started with us virtually in a four credit class that we have to make any kind of schedule changes because these are credits that will appear on the student's transcript and applications to college. So we want to be very intentional about how we schedule around this. Um, this third bullet is, uh, well, let me go back to the second bullet again. I mentioned it briefly, but the challenge will be, and one of our major challenges is how to divide each classroom on the secondary level by subject in an A group and a B group? How do you reduce the number of students who will be in a, in a space on our campus at any given time to comply with the CDC and uh, VDH guidelines of six foot distancing? That third bullet is our, is our second biggest challenge 
because um, we have some of our classrooms are older and very small and you'll when we've been in there and we even have a dowel that several dowels that are measure six feet and we've been around and and move the desk every possible way to try to find a way to maximize the space in there while keeping students six feet apart. And what that means for us is most of our classrooms, that number is around 12. Some even less than that. We have some classrooms where it's as, as few as six. Fortunately, um, our middle school modular units, our trailers, are larger and some of those will hold up to 18, 17, 18 students. So um, these are all the, the gory details of our planning process that we're involved in right now as we um, plan next steps. Lastly, and we talk about this often, you, as you all, many of you know, several of our high school students, over 100, um, attend New Horizons programs that, uh, from governor's school to CTE programs and special ed programs and we have to marry our schedule to their schedules and work with uh, individually with each one of these schedules to make sure that we don't take any uh, opportunities away from students who are enrolled in New Horizons. We have technology needs. Fortunately, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We have uh, been um, awarded significant money as part of CARES Act funding to buy, purchase some new tech tools. I was sharing with a few board members earlier tonight that we have some new high-tech cameras um, uh, on the way, and that will help us to prepare our uh, delivery of, of hybrid instruction where we have students in front of us and, and being broadcast uh, distantly. At the same time, we, um, we have to check and see if our network can handle it. We've upgraded our uh, bandwidth significantly. I think it's over two gigabytes. Two gigabytes, and we're using around seven to eight hundred megabytes of, of um, bandwidth daily, which means we have the capability to do more, and we're excited about that. But these are things we have to prepare for and be ready because the last thing we want to do is launch and then not be able to deliver. Um, we have to practice. Where are we going to place the cameras? How are our teachers going to deliver this and then evaluate its, its success? Um, uh, and then finally, how will our communication work? And we're going to talk more about that as we go through. Special education, um, students with special needs. Every uh, individual education plan will need to be revisited, and you can see the numbers there, I won't read them to you, but uh, we have significant numbers. These are meetings that, that must take place to make sure that all of the, uh, the, those students' needs are, are met and prepared for as we transition from hybrid learn, I mean from virtual learning to a hybrid model. So all of that has to happen in the coming weeks. As well, and I won't get into the details of this, but there's an important December 1 special ed headcount that matters for funding, and so IEPs can't be changed during that window. So we have to have a significant portion of this work done uh, outside of that window where this count takes place. Um, nothing really effective happens in public education or any kind of education without high quality professional learning. That's where our teachers learn how to do what they do and do it well. So we have a, a, a list of things that our teachers are going to have to learn to do differently over the next several weeks while they're teaching. Um, you've, those people around me have heard me make this expression that I learned from my father. He said, Artie, you're always trying to build the boat, paint it, and sail it all in the same day. And I've been accused of that. I, move a little too fast and folks around me have to say back up till it back up slow down but some of this is what we're trying to do we have to make sure that our staff while they're teaching school learn how to do this next step differently um, and we need to practice um, we've talked a lot about that uh, health and safety one of the tools that we use now and any of you have pre-K through fifth grade uh, are well aware and you get a 
text every morning at about 6.32. Uh, that's when mine comes in. And you answer some questions about what, uh, your own personal health. And that qualifies you to come to school or work. And um, we have to then grow that model to another group of, of our students um, and make sure that that is effective and we, we are prepared to welcome those students to school and the screenings, which is required by the uh, VDH protocols, um, happens efficiently. We have to develop um, training videos for our new students to be on campus. How to walk down the hall, how to wear your mask, how to wash your hands. It all sounds simple, but it's all very, very important and part of the requirements that we have in order to safely transition kids to school. We have to respond to our teacher concerns about transmission, whereas our younger learners, our young scholars are less susceptible. Some of our teachers, especially teachers with pre-existing conditions, may be more susceptible. So we have to be sensitive to that and very focused on the needs of our employees. We, that last is a selfless plug. I need a nurse in the middle school, so if anybody wants to apply for that job, we'd love to have you. Um, transportation. We're talking about transporting more students to campus. Now, uh, these are 77 passenger buses generally. Is that right, Steve? And we can put only half of those numbers on there uh, to physically distance our students safely to school, which requires us to have additional planning in how we transport students to and from school safely. Um, we have to adjust and manage the drop-off and pick-up sites. And we have extraordinary cleaning. Every, uh, after every load of students is transported, we then um, spray a high-tech sanitation um, chemical on every seat and up and down every aisle before we bring in another cohort of students on that bus. So these are extraordinary measures that take time and energy and the planning um, is significant. Food services, we have to uh, feed students in classrooms and um, our primary principal and elementary principal can tell you how all of that works. It's, it's happening very, very efficiently, but there's planning in that and now we have to plan that in um, another school environment and some of those environments are trailers with ramps and um, the environment, rain and hope not snow, um, transporting food in and out of classrooms to feed students safely and distanced. Um, food services. Other considerations, uh, child care. As you know, our teachers who are currently in our buildings teaching remotely have been able to bring their own children in that environment. They're safe and secure in their parents' classroom while they deliver remote instruction. The teachers who are teaching in person, we've offered a child care program to help um, uh, this challenge for our teachers who are teaching in person in the primary and elementary school. Now we have to expand that and grow that. And it's currently taking place in the um, high school gym, I mean cafeteria, which we will not have available when we bring high school students in. So we have to find other spaces to continue to offer childcare to our staff, uh, a growing number of our staff. Um, We are going to conduct, uh, one of the next steps is conduct a survey so that we can start preparing for next semester because we, we're moving pretty quickly to see if we need to plan more students, for more students second semester who may want to transition over from the Pocosin Online model to the continuum now that we're uh, transitioning more kids back. So we have to plan for all of that at the same time. It doesn't make sense for us to plan for one opening and then turn around and replan and reshuffle that deck for second semester. So that planning is ongoing as well. Um, just some ideas. 
Uh, you may have been reading some of the other planning stages from around us. Uh, York County, for example, is talking about transitioning um, as they, when they phase in their, their secondary students, they're talking about sixth and ninth graders to be their first cohorts of groups to come in on a hybrid schedule. That's one option we, that we're talking about. There's a possibility of combining um, sixth and seventh graders and then eighth and ninth. There's some logic in all of that. Uh, as you know, sixth and seventh graders are housed uh, on the elementary school campus and the eighth graders are housed on the high school campus at this time. And as well, the eighth grader, many eighth graders take ninth grade courses like algebra. So it makes sense to combine those schedules. So these are just details in our planning that it's important for our um, constituents to understand. And then lastly, but certainly not least, maybe most importantly, we have to communicate this process once we get close to our families so they can make necessary arrangements for child care and transportation and all these other things uh, for their individual family needs. So these are the primary processes. I won't read this from uh, uh, Dr. Fauci, but um, what he says I agree with. We need to get kids back in school. Um, and every expert you've heard from says it, even the ones who are charged with protecting us from COVID and investigating the risk of that. They all agree, we all agree, kids need to be in school. It's the best place for them to be. Um, I tell people all the time, I've been in this business for 30 years. I've been in school my whole life. My parents made me go to kindergarten. And I have been in school since. And I'm old. I love school. I don't know anything but school. And when people say to me, why are you not bringing the kids in school? I say, we're going to as soon as we can safely do it because school is the best place for kids. It's healthy. We, we take care of them. We love them. We take care of their social emotional needs. We, we laugh with them. We cry with them. We make them feel like this is their second home. And so we want kids in school, but we've got to do it safely. Questions, comments, I know, it's a lot of information, I'm sorry. Every time I get ready to do this, we, uh, uh, Dr. Fox and I say, okay, let's try to do it in 10 slides. <laughs> Maybe, well, okay, how about 15 slides? <clears throat> I'm sorry, a lot of information. Yeah. Freeman has yep. a question. Freeman. I had a quick question about the live streaming. Um, so basically you're putting a video camera any legalities with like filming children? Uh, no, and we've checked that out. Um, one of the things that we have to be careful about is if we are um, uh, broadcasting to the general public um, something that is going on in a classroom, we have to be very careful about that. And there's laws that, FERPA laws that, that protect that. And we even have um, a document that all of our parents sign allowing us to share that information publicly or not. And, um, but in a classroom, that de uh, virtual delivery is considered the classroom. So what's going on in there is the virtual classroom space and perfectly appropriate. Now, there's some training that has to go on. We certainly, it, in the same way as in a classroom, we do want to be sensitive to folks' needs and concerns about their, uh, their own personal learning. So that's part of the training that has to want to educate our staff and how to do that effectively. But uh, it's been advised by attorneys and all the folks that look at it that um, the virtual classroom, which is what this would be, um, extends wherever that uh, virtual classroom extends. And it's allowed to be um, engaged just like in the space inside the building. But good question. And um, that's uh, one of the questions that a lot of um, school divisions have been wrestling with. How do you handle the delivery? We've, every school division has had some bumps in the road with that, things that they've seen. I read an article this morning where um, a, a grandmother uh, uh, was having a stroke in the um, middle of a virtual class and the teacher called 911 from the virtual class for the grandmother at home uh, who was needing medical emergency. So it's just interesting that this, our new environment uh, extends into the home, our classrooms. Good, good point, good question. Other questions? Anybody else? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mm -hmm. Tillett. I appreciate that, sir. Very uh, lots of obstacles to overcome, and I know y'all are working almost around the clock to uh, get all those. Uh, financial update with Ms. Woodruff. Good evening, Chairman Carter and members of the school board um, for the finance report this evening. I want to start with a quick review of the CARES funding. When it gets up, hang on. Since our last meeting, we have been allocated additional CARES funding. We were awarded $92,776 through a competitive grant process by the state under the Governor's Emergency Education Relief, or GEAR, and Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, or ESSER, set aside funds. We also were just allocated $370,000 through the state's Coronavirus Relief Fund, or CRF. And the City Council also just allocated an additional $26,449, which brings the total so far from the City of $112,449. Along with the previous state allocation of $55,000, we have now been allocated over $630,000, which is a tremendous amount of money. We also have an additional request of $160,000 that the City Council will consider on Monday evening to help fund a PMS gym project, which Mr. Tillett will discuss in more detail later this evening. Uses of this CARES funding have included PPE, student technology and hotspot devices, cameras and streaming technology for virtual teaching, health screening app, touchless faucets and flush valves for restrooms, food service delivery carts, cleaning supplies, and sprayers. We are very appreciative of this funding, which has allowed us to better prepare our schools during this pandemic. Now I want to switch gears to the impact aid, which is um, something that we normally work on to collect data in October. Impact aid is one of the federal funding sources that we include in our budget. As you know, impact aid is a U.S. Department of Education program that provides financial assistance to local school divisions. PCPS receives basic support payments for federally connected students, which are those students whose parents or legal guardians are active duty military or work on federal property. Impact aid funding is distributed based on the percentage of a school division's federally connected population. And based on last year's survey, PCPS had 590 federally connected students, which was about 28% of our total school population. Active duty military accounts for about 51% of these students. We are required to compile information and report annually by January to support funding for the following fiscal year. Therefore, in order to deter determine eligibility for students enrolled in our schools, an annual impact aid survey form must be completed. This year, because we're virtual, the survey form will be completed using the parent portal, which is the same method that we've been using for other forms already this year. The survey will be based on employment as of October 28th, and information will be sent home to families about this survey on, the on that date. Impact 8 does require that a separate form be completed for each student, so when parents are in Parent Portal, they'll just toggle between their connected students. This form should be completed and as soon as possible, but no later than November 6th. And we really appreciate everyone taking the time to complete these forms to assist in our effort to secure this federal funding for our schools. And that concludes my report. 
questions there? Thank you, Ms. Woodruff. Next up, operations update with Mr. Pappas. Good evening, school board, Chairman Carter, Superintendent Tillett. report we as you know most people do have insurance we do too and our insurance company offers us the opportunity annually to request um, grants and we just received three grants which is about half of the money we're eligible for I'm putting together another grant request one was for non-slip paint if you've been out to the trailer area at the elementary school we decided to put non-slip paint on all the stair treads as well as the numerous ramps that are out there. We have added a stop arm, a rear stop arm to a bus that we bought and uh, that will help us. The goal is to indicate to people who are driving one way or the other to please stop. And then we've also added um, an optional um, set of uh, lights that you'll see here in a second. This is a picture of one of the access points. Um, obviously, it's the one closest to the front of the school. And you can see the blacktop here. If this, if I know how to use this, right there. This is the blacktop to make an easy transition for somebody, students both with and without mobility issues. This is the ramp, and there's the non-slip surface and then we've done that at each and every one of our access points so <clears throat> here is a typical bus when you buy it um, and you notice it just has one stop arm that comes out and we added a second um, to again help drivers realize that we're in the process of loading or unloading and this is the high-tech lights that we just bought. And I can tell you that in the evening, um, and especially in the morning when we're picking up students, you cannot not know that that's, <laughs> that something <laughs> is happening, okay? Because I'm tired of cars driving past buses. And, you know, people talk about cameras. All they do is record the travesty. <coughs> This tells you something is going on, and if it doesn't connect, then we need to just remove your license, in my opinion. <laughs> Food service update. Uh, we bought numerous carts because of COVID. Um, this one here is at the elementary school. Um, this is a breakfast, actually. And then this is the means by which we serve food during COVID. There's some delicious pizza there in case anybody wants some. But what we do is we bring the cart to the classroom. The cart serves as a barrier between the student and the staff. And then the teachers are doing an incredible job. They actually have students get up individually. They come, I think there's a picture, you can see a child here, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I didn't put that picture in. But the child comes up and then the food is transferred to them and there is no touching. The students don't touch the different food and they just get what they're going to receive. And then the modernization plan for the school uh, at the PMS, this is the project timeline. And they have now completed 95% of the drawings. We're in the last 5%. We've reviewed, it's like the New York City telephone book of specifications that we're reviewing and um, critical dates, November 8th, advertised for bids, pre-bid conference, December 15th, we're opening the bids, January 19th, the school board will meet, we'll have gone through, we'll award a contract, October 22nd, substantial completion, and then we will move all the furniture and whatnot back into the school so that on January 3rd of 2023, students will come into the middle school. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? 
What's a foam? Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's a, it's <laughs> called a specification. <laughs> it's a specification book, and it's like three reams of paper. <laughs> and it's got everything from the size and thread to different screws to... So. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. I appreciate it. And uh, instructional update, Dr. Fox. Good evening, Chairman Carter, Vice Chair Sheeler, board members, and Mr. Tillett. Unfortunately, I don't have any blinking lights for you tonight, so sorry. <laughs> um, I did want to give you guys just a quick update on Rovna because we've used it a couple of times. We wanted to share that information with the board and show you how we're using it each day in the schools. Um, so it sends a text message to the student's parent or staff member each day. The questions that we're using are derived from the CDC screener. Um, and it does rely, Rovna does rely on parents and staff members to reply honestly to the series of questions. Um, and so we need people to continue to do that. So if you're not feeling well or you have a temperature, we need you to be honest about that. Um, schools and offices are still continuing to conduct on-site temperature screenings. That's just another part of our health and safety plan. Um, so last night, we did send to all of the board members, you got a Rovna text. See who was complying. As a, te as a test. Um, we wanted you guys to experience this in real time. Um, and so this is what a screening report looks like for um, our principals and their staff members every day when they're going through it. Um, and Gary's what you I'm sorry. Why was Gary's red? Gary's I, uh, is red. Mr. Carr, Dr. Yeah, Carr is red because no, he they, was denied entry. <laughs> right. And there were a couple of uh, symptoms. And I'm like, I wonder what would happen if yeah. I just checked one. Yeah. So, so I checked I'll one you. and. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so that's why he's red. You'll see that uh, where I'm listed, it's gray. It's because I didn't respond. They're still waiting for me to respond. And then Mr. Freeman and Ms. Helso, you guys responded and were cleared so you can see their response there. Um, and what we can do each day is we can screen and pull out what we want. So when kids are coming in, the administrators and their teams are pulling through. They're looking for the folks that are denied and or unanswered. We're gonna catch those unanswered folks when they come in either on the bus, we'll do a quick discreet screening with those students, or if they're coming through the parent line, we can just ask the parents those questions very quickly. We can enter them into the system and then move on from that. Um, and so again, you'll see here, um, this is where we filtered it for what we call verified screening. So those, these are folks who are okay to come to work or school and that's what the system will show you as completed and verified. Um, these are denied entry, so we got a couple folks who um, need to get themselves together. Um, and then what we can do, what is interesting here, because we do want to check on these folks, either whether they're students or staff members who have been denied, we can look and see why they were denied. So for instance, I picked Ms. Reimers because she really needs some help. Um, <laughs> she has multiple symptoms, but she also checked that she's traveled to an area where there's a high rate of COVID transmission. So we would call Ms. Reimers and check on her. If it's a student, the school nurse would call and check and make sure everybody's okay. Um, and then, like I said, you're still waiting for me to respond. So that would be somebody we would catch in the screening process when they arrived, um, either to the work site or to the school building. Um, and we just want to take a moment to thank all of the parents and the staff members for their assistance with this. We're having incredibly high percentage of people responding. Um, and that's, that's awesome. We need that because that's, again, it's a part of our safety plan. It's helping everybody to feel a little bit better about what we're doing when we bring students into the building. Um, so we just want to thank everybody for that. As we begin to bring more students in, um, parents will, see, will receive an informational email with details because they will start to get those text messages in the morning. So we have a process for that. We'll send out that information prior to it um, and then work with parents if the numbers aren't correct and things like that. The other update I have for you tonight, we're going to give you more of a demonstration next month of Canvas, but we just wanted to give you a quick update um, that we're continuing to refine our deployment of Canvas based on teacher, student, and parent feedback. We appreciate that feedback. We're using it and turning things around as quickly as we can. The teachers are being very responsive. Um, when they have suggestions, we have a process for that as well. Um, our virtual learning committees are meeting, as Mr. Tillett shared earlier 
principals are having ongoing conversations with teachers um, to evaluate the instructional content that's being delivered, as well as the number of assignments that are being delivered. We're getting feedback that there's too many and not enough. Um, so in the gamut of all of that. Our teachers, our counselors, our technology staff, our school administrators, all of them stand ready to support students um, who may be experiencing issues, whether those are um, instructionally related academic issues, whether they're Canvas or work management, or if they even just need some organizational support. All of our staff are here and willing to support you. Just call us and tell us that you need some help. And as I shared next month, we'll give you an update and walk through some specific things related to Canvas. We are very excited tonight to introduce to you what we're calling the PCPS Parent Cyber Cafe. Um, and thank you to Mrs. Emily Forrest, who's our new Professional Learning and Digital Communications Administrator, and Mrs. Kim Montalvo, our Instructional Technology and Instructional Data Administrator. We have very long titles in Picosan. Um, for developing this first series of our Cyber Cafe sessions. These will be virtual sessions that will run on Thursday evenings from about 7 to 7.30. And we're going to just present some information to parents and then allow time for questions afterwards. The first session will be later this month, and it will be on tips on navigating Canvas. And uh, we will email out and post on all of our social media um, networks information about that. So look for that information coming, and we hope that you'll join us for these informational sessions. And then finally tonight, um, our high school and our elementary virtual open house activities did begin today. Um, the primary and the middle school held their activities last week. So parents receive an email from the principal with details and information on how to welcome, uh, view the welcome video from the superintendent, from school administrators and counselors, as well as information from our teachers. And parents can view this information at their convenience whenever they're ready. Um, and that concludes my report this evening, Dr. Carter. Very much, Dr. Fox. Uh, does anybody have questions there? Can I, can I touch on a couple things? Dr. Fox, for clarification, um, it seems like the, the, um, the concerns that I get from a lot of parents in the community are hinging around the student's ability to properly upload items through Canvas, mm -hmm. um, that, it, that, that there's some instances where you know, um, students are doing it four, five, six times. Um, to the point where even parents are trying to log on to figure out what's going on and some of our teachers have made the determination to to start emailing documents which is concerning to me just given the volume I'm, I'm sure it's you know talked about I know it's been referenced and let's talk any insight or any feedback that we can give parents at this time about ways we're trying to better that situation for them yeah we are we don't want things emailed because that's defeating the purpose of what a learning management system is Correct. for but what we do need are those specific instances when a situation like that occurs so if parents have or students have that occurring what would be really really helpful is to email our help desk or the teacher with the specific assignment and the time. Um, because then we can go in there, that these instances are happening in weird situations, so we're trying to figure out what it is on the background um, that's causing it. But what's very helpful for us is that we can then backtrace where that's happening. But we need the specific instance. So if a teacher, or, or excuse me, a parent or a student, just email the teacher or the help desk with that information, and that'll help us problem solve it. One additional question, sorry. Um, Ms. Reimers, for example, in her health screening, um, given those the cough and the fever, what is the return to school policy, or do we have one currently? And if you could kind of touch on that, like if she got a false positive for potential for COVID, is it a 14-day waiting period? What does that look like to just kind of reassure parents that we're well, it's complicated and it's different depending on where you land. But for the bottom line is if anybody has a fever, there's a 24-hour waiting period with that. You have to be fever-free without medication to be able to return. In a situation like what Mrs. Reimers listed, we are encouraging parents um, to have their child checked out by a healthcare professional. At that point, the healthcare professional is going to make the determination of whether um, a flu test, a strep test, a COVID test is necessary. If that student or staff member is COVID tested, there's a series of things that will go into place. We'll contact trace who has been around that student or staff member, and those people will be um, quarantined until that test comes back. Um, so there's a whole series of different things. If somebody tests positive, um, there's a whole series of steps that we take for that. We do have outlined information on our FAQs on our reopening of school plan. 
um, and we have a whole we have pages of if then scenarios of what we're doing um, we are then contacting the people that are um, in the immediate area of someone if they test positive or they're suspected for testing positive and that's how our process rolls out so the best thing to do is if you're symptomatic or having anything is check with your doctor they're going to make the decision about whether or not you get tested we just then need to know that information so that we can move forward with our procedures. Does that answer your question? Yes. And finally, for Ravna, who is who is um, who gets that that di those data points? Does is the administration? Is it their teacher who has access to that material? The principals have okay. that information, and they're working with a team each morning who can see those screenings. Um, we're out with iPads, and they're moving through that information. But it goes. Um, we have everybody divided into groups based on the school, and the principal is the one that's monitoring that. I'm checking it, for instance, for our central office staff. Miss um, Ryer uh, is checking it for our student services staff. So we have different people assigned to check it each morning to make sure everybody's where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Good questions. Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Dr. Faulkner. Uh, next public comment. Do we have any public comment, Ms. Ryan? Thank you. And Ms. Sheila, would you walk us through the consent agenda, please? Sure. The consent agenda includes uh, the approval of the minutes of September's regular meeting, the approval of financial reports, the approval of personnel action, and the authorization to change appropriation and to accept and expend funds in, in accordance with the request in the board packet. Thank you, ma'am. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, Ms. Reimers? Aye. Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mrs. Hessel? Aye. Vice Chair Sheeler? Aye. Chairman Carver? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Other matters for consideration up first is consideration of approval of PCPS capital improvement plan for fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 26. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Typically, uh, and you all are well aware of this, having, having done it, uh, many of you, for many years, um, about this time of year, you're asked to approve the capital improvement plan. Um, and this is not different in Pocosin than it is most anywhere. Capital improvement is generally made up of large ticket items that what boards typically do, because there's never enough money, is we kick that can down the road year after year after year in hopes that you're going to have a windfall year and be able to really, really chip away at some of these items. And um, I learned that's certainly the way it is in Pocosin. But with that said, um, so this year we were planning to come to you with a similar plan that you've approved year after year, looking out over five years with um, extensions of big ticket items like school buses and chillers and um, major expenditures. Um, and with that said, this year is an, an anomaly. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about something, I, and, and again, I've been at this a long time, and I, I've never done this, to move something forward <coughs> instead of back. So we're excited tonight to ask you to amend your um, capital improvement plan to some projects that were out in 2024 that we might get to in 2024 if the stars all lined up forward to 2022. Now, why that's important is your this plan is for 2022 start date and goes out through beyond 2026. So what we're asking tonight is that you consider moving two big items um, that were in 2026 up to 2022, totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, we're going to try to walk you through why that's possible and we think very important um, for you to consider. First, let me just say that um, in your um, previous capital improvement plan has been there for some time is to add an HVAC system to your uh, high school gymnasium. Um, the bu building was built without air condition. 
Um, when I arrived in Pocosin um, in June, my realtor um, said to me, first thing, um, uh, you and the superintendent, can you put some air conditioning in that gymnasium out there? Um, my kid plays volleyball, and it's too hot in August to play volleyball in the gym. What we're talking about tonight is really not about the comfort of students playing volleyball or basketball, um, although that's important. Um, we're talking about um, an opportunity tonight uh, to improve the air quality in a time that we have um, uh, a virus circulating in our world and the we would probably not feel comfortable using that gymnasium while COVID is still around with any children in it for any length of time without air circulation there's some really good science out there about the importance of high quality air circulation uh, Mr. Pappas has reported uh, the upgrades to our HVAC systems and our other buildings to get it to 13 MERV compliance, which screens out the vast majority of these um, aerosols. Um, this project is expensive, um, and it's um, something that probably we would get to, and maybe not even in 2024 when that time comes. So I'm going to just leave that for a minute and um, let you know that's something we want you to consider moving forward, and then we're going to talk in a minute about why we think that's important. Um, secondly, also in 2024, is your um, turf field. Now, when I got to Pocosin, I was surprised and amazed that a community this size has an AstroTurf field. Um, that's a bragging rights that anybody who loves football, um, like I do, uh, I quickly called my folks back home and said, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> uh, this is incredible, and what a wonderful uh, tribute to a community that cares about kids and wants to do special things for um, young people. Uh, this field is amazing. The problem is it's old. Uh, it was built, it was laid out in 2008, I believe. So it's, um, by the time this plan uh, is considered for 2022, it'll be 14 years old. The lifespan's about eight to 10 years, and we've patched and repatched, and we've used all the patch work available. So if we patch it again, it's going to be uh, not match. It'll be a discoloration. So um, we think this is an, another, although very expensive, project that we should move up to 2022. Now, this is not something we're going to tackle now. This is just two projects we've moved up. We've had conversations with the city manager and his staff. And um, we believe this is smart to move these two projects up um, for consideration on your uh, capital improvement plan. Now, that's where they exist. You see they were back here in 2024. They've been moved up. Um, other than that, the plan is, is uh, pretty much what you've seen over the last several years. So the first thing we're going to ask you to do tonight is approve that capital improvement plan with those two items moved forward. Um, so table that thought for just a moment. That'll be your, uh, that's our request for your next order of business. That has to happen first. Once you approve that as the governing body of the schools, um, I'm taking it to city council on Monday night along with the support of um, uh, your city manager to um, ask for uh, some shared responsibility and shared um, investment from our CARES money that um, uh, Tara spoke to you about a few minutes ago. This um, coronavirus relief fund has been awarded to school divisions all over the state and municipalities over a period of time, starting in over the summer. And this money came in, in uh, fairly large increments. And I have to say, and I don't say this, um, uh, lightly, um, City Council in Pocosin has been extremely generous to Pocosin City Public Schools in sharing this money. They received pots of money from uh, the COVID relief fund, as did the schools, and City Council has been very generous with us sharing 
their pots of money. Some division, some uh, counties and cities have done that, some have not. But Pocosin has, and it's made this conversation we're having tonight possible. Um, the other piece that's on your agenda for you to consider tonight is purchase of a, a brand new school bus. And you will be familiar with this, and you've looked at this over the years. Our bus fleet um, is aging. Um, I think we have some buses that are somewhere around 27, 28 years old, and the average bus life is about 15 years. So we've, with a lot of hard work from Steve and his team, and um, we've kept these buses rolling. And uh, in your capital plan, every year there's the replacement of a bus. COVID fund uh, has allowed us the opportunity to buy a new bus now. And so that's uh, an item on your agenda that you'll look at next. And I put it all together in this presentation because we're sharing this pot of money that some of the city will provide and some we have come directly to us by um, uh, ADM, average daily membership portion of this $200 million plus dollar fund that um, we benefit in part of, as does the city. So because we're sharing these funds, it's made it possible for us to purchase immediately large ticket items, one being a new school bus, and secondly, uh, partnering with the city on um, adding HVAC to our gymnasium. The bus was also another uh, very fortunate break for us. Um, we were not the only school division who received money. Every school division did. And when it was determined pretty quickly that because of social distancing on buses, this qualifies as one of the expenditures to use the COVID funds. So uh, Steve quickly got a hold of uh, his bus route and we were able to acquire a brand new gas bus that um, uh, we, were, we will be able to purchase with your approval tonight. And um, we're very excited about that. Uh, that's something that we'll receive quickly. And this is in addition to a bus we already had budgeted that has arrived today. today. Yes, I knew it was en route. Um, so this is exciting news uh, for Picosa. Two new buses uh, in our fleet um, with an aging uh, fleet. So what we're asking you to do tonight is first approve at, at, at your pleasure the uh, capital improvement plan that moves up two projects, the turf field and the HVAC system from 2024 to next school year. Then we're going to ask you to approve the appropriations of $103,000 of COVID relief fund money to purchase the bus and then to share another portion of that money with funds from city council that we believe will be approved on Monday night to complete immediately the HVAC project at Pocosin High School. Um, something I failed to mention, uh, the caveat to this money is it has to be spent by the 30th of, uh, of December. So um, we have a short time frame. Uh, Mr. Pappas has uh, communicated with the folks that we would um, be purchasing this um, HVAC system and we believe that the project will be complete in that time frame and funds will be expended and um, this will be a great opportunity for the kids and families of Pocosin to have these um, two large ticket items paid for pretty quickly out of this um, pot of money that again qualifies because of air quality in our gym and distancing requirements for the bus. Questions? Thank you sir. Let's make a motion first. Uh, okay. I have a motion to approve and a second. All right now does anybody have questions? Mr. Tiller. I mean, the great thing about the gym and um, having graduated 18 years ago, that's been talked about for 25 years. <laughs> so what I've heard since 1990 when I graduated. Yeah, it's been, so it's been a long, long standing issue. Um, now, on the flip side, it was always a competitive advantage to have a hot gymnasium. So, having practiced and trained in there for years, it was always a, a nice thing to have. Uh, as for the turf field, you know, the turf field doesn't just impact our school system. It really impacts our community on so many levels. Our youth, um, you know, sports utilize that uh, regularly. 
Parks and Rec uses it for summer camps regularly. And there comes a point actually on that turf field that after a prolonged period of time, if you do not replace it properly, it actually can can be a little bit of a detriment and cause a, a injuries, injuries yeah. or further injuries uh, to our youth. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that certainly has to be done as well. So um, we're fortunate to have that opportunity tonight. It's a great idea to replace the field because you can't open a new school and have a raggedy look. <laughs> True. So I'm, I'm also very excited about all three projects. Um, the one thing I will say, if I recall correctly, from when we initially put the field down, it was a phased um, approach stadium as well. So I, I don't know if we can make adding that to the CIP in the future so that we can get that done? Absolutely. We, we, we will revisit the capital uh, improvement plan every year. So that would be a great idea once we get this uh, approved at City Council to bring that up because that makes a lot of sense to go ahead and add that to the capital to get it somewhere in the next five-year plan. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Ms. Reimers. Aye. Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mrs. Hessel? Aye. Vice Chair Sheeler? Aye. Chairman Carter? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Next is authorization to superintendent to sign the purchase agreement to purchase 2019-77 passenger gasoline school bus. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second? Second. Any questions there? Who was the second? I'm getting an air. That's awesome. All right, Ms. Reimers. Mr. Freeman. Aye. Mr. Ingram. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Mrs. Hessel. Aye. Vice Chair Sheeler. Aye. Chairman Carter. Aye. Motion passes six zero. Item C: Consideration of approval of proclamation for school bus week, uh, school bus safety week. Um, the average school bus transports 54 students, replacing approximately 36 family vehicles. Uh, and of course you have the convenience and efficiency there. They're designed with safety measures, including bright colors, stop sign arm, or yes, yeah, stop sign arms, cross view mirrors, and uh, school bus transportation employees should be recognized for their steadfast commitment to safely transporting Pocosin students. And they do a amazing job. And uh, Mr. Pappas, we always hear each year about what a great job they do, and now we safety measures. So do I have a motion to approve the proclamation? So moved. And second? Second. Any comments, questions there? Ms. Reimer? Mr. Freeman? Aye. Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mrs. Hessel? Aye. Mr. Sheeler? Aye. Chairman Carter? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. And the added item from our second agenda item is item D, and as a motion to authorize the superintendent to sign a contract with Warwick Mechanical Group for the installation of an HVAC system in the PHS gym. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. At second. Second. Any questions there? Any idea when when uh, that would that process would potentially take like in, ter in terms of installation? Yeah, it, it will. Uh, assuming that um, all, everything passes on Monday night at City, City Council, we'll start immediately. Uh, Mr. Pappas has already been in uh, uh, conversation with um, the uh, installers, and um, we think that it uh, will. We're certain that we can get this done by the deadline, which is December the 30th. So we'll start immediately and should be complete com, uh, completed by the end of December. Anybody else? Ms. Reimers? Mr. Freeman? Aye. Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mrs. Hessel? Aye. Vice President Sheeler? Aye. Chairman Carter? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Next item communication, other matters. Uh, we will kick that off with Mr. Tillett. Uh, no other matters, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And our newest member, Ms. Spake. Would you take it away, Cassidy? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and start with the Pocosin Primary School. Pocosin Primary School has successfully started the school year and we are proud of our students and staff. Each day, we run four different schedules, Pocosin Online, Hybrid in Person, Hybrid at Home, and Preschool. Our staff have welcomed our students both in person and virtually. 
a new year with smiles behind their masks or even behind them. Our staff is taking every precaution to keep our learning environment safe and healthy. Masks, cleaning, and distance are part of our daily routines and our students are doing a fantastic job adjusting to the new procedures. We look forward to a great school year. Pocosin Elementary School. The Pocosin Elementary School has successfully brought hybrid third graders into school on September 8th and hybrid fourth and fifth graders into school on October 12th. Students in both virtual and in-person classes are off to a great start. Students and staff are wearing masks when they cannot maintain six feet of distance with Lunch and breakfast are free for all students this year and students are enjoying delicious meals prepared by caring hands. Students at PES have live encore classes while at school in asynchronous classes at home. At PES, art, library, and music teachers go to the classroom, but for PE, students may go to the gym for instruction. October is National Bullying Prevention Month and at, excuse me, it is a spirit week for the elementary school. On Monday, PES put a lid on bullying by wearing a favorite hat. Today, the theme was socket to bullying, with students wearing crazy socks. Wednesday will be Unity Day, and the staff and students can wear orange. Thursday will be back off to bully, and students and staff may wear their clothes backward. Finally, on Friday, we will end the week with dreaming of a bully-free school, and students and staff may wear We encourage students at home to participate also. Please be sure to wear appropriate shoes for outdoor recess. PES would like to say a big thank you to all those who have supported us in so many wonderful ways. Pocosin Middle School. Pocosin Middle School would like to thank parents and community for their support and collaboration. We value the time spent and effort put forth by students, staff, and parents as we navigate through virtual learning together. You are all doing great and we appreciate you immensely. The social and emotional health of our students has been and remains a focus at Pocosin Middle School. In September, school counselors led school-wide lessons focused on at-home organization and self-care. This month, counselors are recognizing National Bullying Prevention Month by presenting lessons each one on including others, celebrating diversity, respecting one another, listening patiently, and sharing To conclude October, students can look forward to celebrating Red Ribbon Week, a drug awareness and prevention campaign, by participating in lessons days from October 26th to the 30th. And lastly, Pocosin High School. Despite the untraditional nature of this year, the high school is off and running for the 2020 to 2021 school year. Our new oceanography and second level of criminal justice courses are underway and our students are actively learning across the curriculum. Our faculty continues to explore ways to engage all students in learning and are planning project-based learning experiences for students. In addition, they are helping them to navigate the Canvas learning management system. We welcomed many of our islanders for the distribution of textbooks and course materials at the end of September, and any students still need to retrieve items should contact their teachers. Our counseling department has been busy making virtual classroom visits. They have also begun conducting meetings with members of the class of 2021 for post-secondary planning as well as holding the first of two college application workshops. Our SEA is working to plan virtual spirit activities and our athletic department began conditioning workouts this week. We look forward to conducting senior and underclass pictures at the end of the month and continuing to find creative ways to engage. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Cassidy. Uh, Mr. Freeman. Um, we had a couple community winners. I want to make sure they had an opportunity. They were late coming in. So. Um, I'd like to welcome Ms. Cassidy to the uh, school board. Um, expecting great things. Love the point. Love on that. Um, last Thursday, I was able to attend the uh, first SEAC advisory committee. And uh, Ms. Ryer did a great job. Very informative. So just letting everybody know it was, it was good. things were well there. And. Um, Gordon mentioned earlier, um, he was contacted by several community members and emails about concerns. I've been getting those as well, sure some of y'all have as well. And everything's the same. Open schools, open schools, open schools. And 
every one of y'all know since July I've been saying raise the pirate flag and open like a Monday. And you saw today a whole list of reasons why we can't do that. So just general public to be aware, our five person staff is doing everything excuse me, everything they can to get our students in school. It's just hard. Be patient. We all want the same thing. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that, Mr. Ingram. Thank you. I concur with uh, Mr. Freeman about uh, opening schools. Uh, Ms. Cassie, thank you for the uh, the inspirational uh, poem. It was it was very positive, and you know I just needed a time like this, and I'm pretty sure you know your fellow students positivity and in, in your attitude so thank you um, I recently joined the Picosan uh, City Public page so it's now available has some great information um, been seeing some uh, some positive referrals to the principal so I thought that was pretty interesting um, and also the uh, the school lunches uh, you anyone uh, Age 1 to 18 can uh, go to the primary school and pick up food on Monday and uh, it should last the whole week for each of the number of kids that you have. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jordan. Well, I've certainly talked enough this evening, but I um, wanted to welcome Cassidy on board uh, and I also wanted to um, just kind of reiterate, we touched on it. It's unfortunate that the teachers of the year were not able to be represented in person. Uh, but Mrs. Yeager, a very familiar face in our school system, Ms. Farringer, Ms. Smith, and our teacher of the year in the division, Ms. Duvall. So just wanted to congratulate them on an outstanding accomplishment. So thanks so much. Thank you. Ms. Hills. Welcome, Cassidy. I'm excited to have you with us. And I could not agree more with what you said, Mr. Freeman, about I'm anxious too. I know we all are. and great time thank you Ms. Sheila yes and uh, welcome Cassidy uh, Christy and I knew you were going to be a, a welcome addition to our board and I did enjoy your thoughtful poem about six feet apart it's good that you can be up and warm in a time like that when we need that thank you and boy I I concur with what I was saying. We really really want the kids back in school we want everybody healthy and we're working on. Yes, congratulations to uh, Ms. Yeager, Ms. Farringer, uh, Ms. Smith, and Ms. Duvall on um, Teacher of the Year. Um, that's an awesome accomplishment. Welcome, Cassidy. I look forward to working with you throughout the year. And I also like to thank City Council for their continued support and their generosity. Uh, and, and I mean, there's always there for us. We can always go to them, and they always do whatever they can to help us get to where we need to be. So hats off to City Council. And Ms. Forrest, the Parent Cyber Cafe, that's a great idea. I love that. I mean, it, it'll be right there so parents can uh, some tutorials, ask questions, and I think that's going to be a hit. So. Um, with that, uh, do we have any material for board review? Thank you, ma'am. Then we will adjourn. Y'all have a good night.